Hello viewers, this is Shag. Today we are doing something that is not quite a video game, and is more of a novelty option, as is previously mentioned. Some of you may know that before video games existed, one primary form of entertainment was books. But, um, what do you do with books, you might ask? Well, you read them. And today we are going to explore this phenomenon by let's read a book. Well, this book thing we've got here is, uh, let's see, <laughs> this book is this book. Now, this is Brisinger, however you say that, but... I have not actually read this, but I have read the two past books in the series by this author, and at first I liked them, but then I kind of realized that they were ripping off everything else. They're very popular, so I might be hated for saying that I don't really like them, but I think it would be entertaining to see what happens when I blindly let's play reading the third book in the series, so... We're going to read this without having any idea of what we're getting into. Dramatic reading of Brisinger. So hooray for that. Look, it's a book. I don't know how I'm going to put this on camera exactly. We begin with a useless map. Yay. This map is... That's a big desert. And uh, there's no reason for the woods to be like do Weldon Varden. It's like crappy German or something. Brisinger! Or the Seven Promises of Aragon Shadeslayer and Safira Bjart Schooler. Inheritance, Book 3, by Christopher Paulini. Now let me. <clears throat> there we go. This looks much more intellectual. Published by some guys. Eyeball. Okay. Now let's see what we're getting into. <clears throat> As always, this book is for my family, and also for Jordan, Nina, and Sylvie, the bright lights of a new generation. Astra este de honor Thilduin. What does that mean? I have no idea. Contents! No, we're not reading the table of contents. That would just be silly. Oh my, this book is long. 800 pages. Synopsis... Whoa. Careful there. Synopsis of Aragon and Eldest. Oh, that's a good place to start. Aragon, a 15-year-old farm boy, is shocked when a polished blue stone appears before him in the range of mountains known as the Spine. Aragon takes the stone to the farm where he lives with his uncle, Garo, and his cousin, Roran. Outside the small village of Carvajal. At least I remember all this. Book one starts really slow. And then gets okay. Garo and his late wife, Marion, have raised Aragon. Nothing is known of Aragon's father. His mother, Selina, was Garo's sister and has not been seen since Aragon's birth. Later, the stone cracks a baby dragon, blah blah blah, so a remark, blah blah blah. <sighs> How long is the synopsis? Because if your synopsis is like a hundred pages, then that means your book sucks. Let's see... Oh, well it's that long. Let's just start, because it's funnier if I don't remember what the heck's going on. The Gates of Death! Aragon stared at the dark tower of stone wherein hid the monsters who had murdered his uncle Gero. He was lying on his belly behind the edge of a sandy hill dotted with sparse blades of grass, thorn bushes, and small rosebud-like cactuses. The brittle stems of last year's foliage pricked his palms as he inched forward to gain a better view of Hellgrind, which loomed over the surrounding land like a black dagger thrust from the bowels of the earth. Gross. The evening sun streaked the low hills with shadows long and narrow and pretentious word choice, and far in the west illuminated the surface of Leona Lake so that the horizon became a rippling bar of gold. That's wonderful. To his left, Aragon heard the steady breathing of his cousin, Roran, who was stretched out behind him. 
the normally inaudible flow of seen <coughs> the normally inaudible flow of air seemed pre preternaturally pre loud to Aragon, with his heightened sense of hearing, one of many such changes wrought by his experience during the <laughs> the Elves' Blood Oath celebration. This is the first page and I already don't like where this is going. <sighs> but we must press on. <clears throat> he paid little attention to that now as he watched a column of... Good morning, YouTube! Okay. He paid little attention to that now as he watched a column of people inch toward the base of Helgrind, apparently having walked from the city of Dresleona some miles away. A contingent of 24 men and women, garbed in thick leather robes, occupied the head of the column. This group moved with many strange and varied gaits. They limped and shuffled and humped it. Wait, what? Humped is not a word for moving, Christopher Paulini. You don't hump to a city. But they also wriggled. And they swung on crutches or used arms to propel themselves forward on curiously short legs. Contortions that were necessary because, as Aragorn realized, Every one of the twenty-four lacked an arm or a leg or some combination thereof. Their leader sat upright upon a litter borne by six oiled slaves, a pose Aragon regarded as a... rather amazing accomplishment, considering that the man or woman, he could not tell which, consisted of nothing more than a torso and a head, upon whose brow balanced an ornate leather crest three feet high. The priests of Helgrind, he murmured to Roran. Can they use magic? Possibly. I dare not explore Helgrind with my mind until they leave, for if they are magicians, they will sense my touch. However, light and our presence will be revealed. Why am I reading Aragon as solid stuff? Behind the priest trudged a double line of young men swathed in gold cloth. Each carried a rectangular metal frame subdivided by twelve horizontal crossbars from which hung iron bells the size of winter rutabagas. Half the young men gave their frames a vigorous shake when they stepped forward with their right foot, producing a dolorous cacophony of notes, while the other half shook their frames when they advanced upon the left foot causing iron tongues to crash against iron throats and emit a mournful clamor that echoed over the hills. The acolytes accompanied the throbbing of the bells with their own cries, groaning and shouting in an ecstasy of passion. As the rear of the grotesque procession trudged, trudged a comet's tail of inhabitants from Drasleona, Nobles, merchants, tradesmen, several high-ranking military commanders, and a motley collection of those less fortunate, such as laborers, beggars, and common foot soldiers and people reading this book. Aragon wondered if Dres Leona's governor, Marcus Tabor, was somewhere in their midst. Drawing to a stop at the edge of the precipitous mound of scree, scree that rigged, rigged Helgrind, the priests gathered on either side of a rust-colored boulder with a polished top. When the entire column stood motionless before the crude altar, the creature upon the litter stirred and began to chant in a voice as discordant as the moaning of the bells. The shaman's declamations were repeatedly truncated by gusts of wind, but Aragon caught snatches of the ancient language, strangely twisted and mispronounced, interspersed with dwarf and urgal words, all of which were united by an archaic dialect of Aragon's own tongue. What he understood caused him to shudder, for the sermon spoke of things best left unknown, of a malevolent hate that had festered for centuries in the dark caverns of people's hearts before being allowed to flourish in the writer's absence, of blood and madness, and of foul rituals performed underneath a black moon. 